Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, tonight's class is sponsored by Moshe Zumbab Badaman, in honor of his mother, his uncle, his grandfather, all the people in the family. Thank you very much for sponsoring the class, and everybody should only hear good news. Amen. Okay, it's the Wednesday night, tomorrow night, Hanukkah. So we're going to do the halachas of Hanukkah, uh, the major halachas of Hanukkah that we need to know. And then for the second half, we're going to discuss um, some Hasidic insights to Hanukkah because Hanukkah is a very, very important Yom Tif. Okay, now, without getting into histor historical facts of Hanukkah that maybe we'll do later, but uh, the Chacham established that for primarily for lighting the Menorah to celebrate, to say Hallel, complete Hallel is said during Hanukkah, Alanisim is said in the Shemonesre, it's forbidden to fast, it's forbidden to make eulogies during Hanukkah. So it really is a, a very holy and great time. But one of the primary mitzvahs of Hanukkah, which is a rabbinic mitzvah, by the way, Hanukkah's, Hanukkah and Purim are the two rabbinic holidays of the year that are alluded to in Chumash, but not actually openly mentioned in the Chumash. Now, um, Every man, woman, and child is obligated in the midst of lighting Hanukkah candles. Now, usually, if a woman is married or she lives with other families, a woman does not light herself unless if she lives alone. If she lives alone, or let's say a dormitory, we're speaking tonight by Yemen Hamar, if a, 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 girl, a bunch of girls are in seminary or they rent a basement, so then one girl at least has to light for all the other girls. But normally, if there's a husband, their father, so then the minig is that the women don't light. Now, according to halacha, even if they're not home, if the women are not home at the time the husband or the father is lighting candles, al-pidin, they still fulfill their obligation. The obligation is on the home and everybody in the home. So once the father lights, even if they're not home and present, at the time of the menorah lighting, they really fulfilled their obligation. Now, one one uniqueness about women, women have a minig because the uh, uh, Yehudis, one of the great daughters of Yechon and Kain Gadol, she chopped off the head of the Greek general, whatever, and a lot of miracles came about because of that. So therefore, women have a custom that they don't work while the candles are burning. That means for the mandatory half an hour from after nightfall for a half an hour that the candles have to burn, for that half an hour they don't work. Some people say they don't do sewing or like cholamari uh, things that you don't do. You don't do laundry, you don't uh, sew, you don't do things like that. But some some people say that they really shouldn't do anything, not even cooking and baking. For the duration of the half an hour they should try to be by the candles and not do any work. Again, if they have to cook and do all those things, halachically, they're allowed to do it. But it's a very strict custom that women don't do laundry, they don't do sewing, basically things that women don't do during cholamayid, during cholamayid Pesach and Sukkot, they sh do, shouldn't be doing when the, when the candles are lit. Um, the boys from the age of chinuch, even today young kids, light the Hanukkah menorah on their own. Now, the preferred way of lighting Hanukkah candles, if possible, is with olive oil, like it was in the base of Migdash. In Chabad, the custom is we use olive oil, but for the Shamis, you know, the one that lights all the others, so then we use a beeswax candle. Now, how long do the can when should the candles be lit, and how long do the candles have to last for? So practically speaking, most people light it after nightfall. Uh, sometimes if you dive a mincha earlier and you dive a later, so then we'll light a little bit after sundown. Now the minimal amount that candles have to burn is a half an hour after nightfall. So let's say if a woman is a guest in somebody else's home for Shabbat dinner, 
The best thing would be for her to light it home first. If not, she could fulfill her obligation in the host's house. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So um, the, the minig is that basically you light it up the mayor. So let's say candle lighting this week is 425 in LA. So let's say approximately sundown is 440, okay, approximately. So uh, nightfall would be here in LA this time of the year, let's say approximately a half an hour. So 510 would be nightfall. The candles have to burn. If you light them earlier, they have to burn at least until 540. Because nightfall is 510, they have to burn at least to 540. Half an hour after nightfall. If you light them 10 o'clock at night, they also have to burn a half an hour. But the, what's unique over here, and this is relevant by Shabbos, if you light the candles early, they still have to burn minimal. Uh, for a half an hour after nightfall. So again, in LA, nightfall would be 510. The candles have to burn at least until 540. If you light the candles 530, they have to burn at least until 6 o'clock. Now, the Rebbe writes him in Hogam, our custom is to light the candles for 55 oh minutes. Questionable what that means, depending when you light it. So in our circles, we try to light the candles should be lit for 50 five oh minutes. From the time we light them, even later, there's a custom to light it for 55 oh minutes, uh, even, even though halachically they only have to burn for half an hour after night. Um, now, where do we place the menorah? Where do we place the Hanukkah menorah? Many people, I'm sure that you see, light it in the window, facing the street, because in, in the Talmudical times, they lit the candles not in the doorway of the house, but on the doorway of the courtyard by the street. There was a street, then a courtyard, and then the houses. People of the courtyard lit the candles by the gate, by the door of the courtyard in the street, because it was for the people of the street to see the Parsumenisa, the spreading out in the publicity of the miracle. Today, some people put it in the window facing the street. In the Chabad, the custom is we do not put it in the window. We light it in the doorway opposite the mezuzah. The mezuzah is on the right side. We light the menorah candle and the menorah on the left side of the door, the door post. Why? So the Gemara says, because then you have a mezuzah on the right and the Hanukkah menorah on the left. So you're surrounded with mitzvahs. Based on that, what happens if somebody is spending Hanukkah in Airbnb or somewhere where there is no mezuzah on the doorpost because it's not a Jewish home, it's a hotel or whatever. Um, so then, halachically, you have to light it on the right side of the door where the mezuzah would be. Because the Gemara says, the read, there's an argument in the Gemara, but the Gemara rules that Mitzvahs on the right, the Hanukkah candles on the left, they should be surrounded by mitzvahs. So the Rishenim right, the early, early codified is right, that if there is no mezuzah, then you put the Hanukkah menorah on the right side of the door. Now, which door? Any door that's safe. You know, you don't want to light it by the front door when the wind is going to blow out the candles. It should be in a place where the family is able to see it. Family is able to see it, and um, and be able to you know see the see the candles of the menorah. The Chabad custom is besides Friday night that we sit near the candles for a half an hour. You light them and you sit a half an hour by the candles. And the previous Rebbe said, the Friedrich Rebbe said that when you look at the candles in that half an hour, you have to. He said the, he said it in Yiddish, but he said. You need to listen to the story the candles are telling. And when we learn the Hasidic part of today's class, we'll, we'll explain what that means. The candles are telling us a story. So the Fenetic Rebbe said that when you look, you're sitting by the candles, you have to listen spiritually 
to the story the candles are saying. Now, another point is like this. Today, most people use these finished, you know, ready, go, ready to go menorahs. But if somebody is using a menorah that you add oil or, or you put wicks into, and this is relevant even to those menorahs, the then is the leftover oil in the menorah and the leftover wick are not allowed to be thrown out. You have to burn them in a separate fire. You could do it at the end of Hanukkah, you take the eight wicks and the oil that's left over in the menorah, you know, the residue of the, of the oil, and you burn it somewhere after Hanukkah. Because you're not allowed to throw it out because they were designated for the mitzvah. But if before you light it, you have in mind or verbal condition that I'm not planning to burn them separately, I want to throw them out afterwards, then you're allowed to. So even the disposable menorahs, there's still a wick in there. The oil is finished, you can throw out the container, but the wick is still there. So the best thing is, before people like the Hanukkah menorah, to have in mind, either mentally or verbally, to say that, uh, to think that the oil and the wick that is in the menorah, I'm able to dispose of it uh, that night or at the end of Hanukkah. The oil that's left in the jar, that's never sanctified. So that oil doesn't become, it's only the oil which is put in the menorah, and uh, that oil needs to be uh, either designated or if you make the condition. Now, according to Allah, to beautify the mitzvah, it's preferable to have a nice, beautiful menorah. Um, you know, especially from the silver, it says if you could buy a silver menorah, it beautifies the mitzvah a lot. Uh, we put it by the door. Uh, now, what, what? Where do? You, where in the door you put it on the? We learned on, on the left side of the door. But where do you put? How high up should the menorah be? So it says in halach, and this is what we are strict about, or try to be strict about. The menorah should be put between three tefachim and ten tefachim, which is. In, in measurements, it's between 9.5 inches and 31.5 inches. Between nine and a half inches and 31 and a half inches. Now that means the flame, not the menorah. The menorah, the mitzvah is the flame. If possible, it's, prep, it's kosher higher than that, it's kosher lower than that. But the Rebbe writes in Minhagen, preferably we try to put the menorah, meaning the flames of the menorah, between, like we said, nine and a half inches and 31 inch, 31 and a half inches. Now, you have to keep in mind something very practical. If you have little kids running around, you don't want to put them in, there, in a doorway where they're going to knock it over and, God forbid, cause a fire or make a big mess. And then everybody's going to yell at each other and you're not going to have a happy Hanukkah. So what you have to keep in mind is safety first. If you have kids and you're afraid to put it into a door post, door frame, what you should do is put it on a table. Maybe make a table higher up in, in the doorway opposite the mezuzah. But it's very important to keep in mind the safety of, of the menorah and, uh, you know, Hanukkah menorah and everything else like that. Now, what is the bracha? So the first night we make Three What happens if a person sees a menorah and they're not going to be able to light on their own for whatever reason? So the first night, they can't say the brach lahad because they're not lighting it. They're just seeing it. So then they make the first day two brachas, Sha'as and Nisim and Shachiyon. The other nights of Hanukkah, if he's gonna if they're gonna see him in there and not light at home or not light anywhere, or nobody's gonna be lighting for them. So then you make the just the bracha Sha'as and Nisim, the first night Sha'as and Nisim and Shachiyon. Okay, now when a person is lighting the menorah, 
let me go back a second. Before you light them, once the time of kindling the menorah comes, it's forbidden to eat a meal. It's forbidden to learn. It's forbidden to do work. It's forbidden to do anything until you light the menorah. So therefore, you have issues many times. People are at places, at parties. They're not going to be lighting the menorah until they come home later at night. So are they allowed to eat or are they not allowed to eat? So the answer is as follows. You cannot eat a meal, i.e., what does a meal mean? Two ounces of bread or two ounces of cake. But if you want to eat a snack, meaning not a meal of bread and cake, halachically, you can eat it before candle lighting. Preferably, to have somebody remind you later to light the menorah when you get home. Now, there's a very practical question. Let's say there's a Hanukkah party. Let's get a practical case. Parents are making a Hanukkah party for their married kids, the grandkids, whatever. Now, the married kids don't live in the parents' house. They have their own places. And they're coming to the party. Are they allowed to light the menorah at the party? Now, normally the din is you need to light the menorah in the place you're sleeping. That means if you're going to go to a party and you're going to be going home, you can't light at the party, preferably. You have to light when you go home. So then the whole issue is, you know, can I eat? Can I not eat? What's the, we're going to miss the party? What the story is? So there are postum that are lenient, that if it's a big hassle to wait until you're going to go home to light the menorah, you could light in the place where you're eating. But that's not the best. The best is somehow to light in the place where you're sleeping. So what would be preferable is you start the party a little later that people can go home, light the candle, stay there half an hour, and then go to the party or, or things like that. Now, there's a big issue in Allah also, people that are traveling. People are traveling. They're going to be in an airplane. Obviously, you cannot light the menorah in an airplane. They'll, they'll throw you off the plane. So there's big shadows I would strongly suggest that you call it off because every detail could be different. Uh, generally speaking, if the person traveling, let's say the husband is traveling for business or whatever, and he's on a plane and he's going to be landing, he's going to Israel. So he's taking a four o'clock, he has to be in the airport, let's say two o'clock, and he's not going to, that night he's going to be on a plane in it to Israel. As long as there's a family member lighting at home, his wife, kids over Baron Bat's mitzvah, he is yates of the mitzvah of Hanukkah candles. If there's nobody going to be home, it says in Allah he should point a proxy, a shliach, to light candles for him in his house. Which means, let's say it's a neighbor. <clears throat> the neighbor should light candles in, in the neighbor's own house with the bracha and everything. He shouldn't talk. And then he should go to the person who left and light candles in that person's house as a proxy, as an agent for the people traveling without a bracha. That's why he shouldn't talk. That The bracha that he made in his house should also be effective for the menorah that he's lighting when the people, for the people that travel. But the people that are going away on business, people that these really you need to ask a Shaila how it, how it could be done. Yet sometimes even a bigger Shah mentioned it tonight in show. What happens if you cross the international date line during Hanukkah? Somebody's traveling to Australia, from Australia to Hong Kong, from Hong Kong, you're losing a day, you're gaining a day. These are all questions that need to be asked to enough to figure out how it could be done. Uh, if somebody is traveling by car, let's say, and then traveling through the night by car, you have to ask a shadow because sometimes they could stop off somewhere and light the candles even in the car because that's where they're going to be spending a little bit of time. 
Well, light the candle, spend a half an hour in the car, eating or doing whatever, and then the yates of the mitzvah that way. So the bottom line is, if somebody is traveling, you know, especially if nobody else is going to be home, so then you need to ask a shayla, you know, what do I do with the with the candles? Another very important din is as follows. The lighting makes the mitzvah. Okay, now, let me preface it with certain halachic things. A menorah that is more than 30 feet high from the ground, from the floor of the house, not from the, from the street. A menorah that is over 30 feet is not a kosher menorah. If you notice, all the big public menorahs are under 30 feet. They're not allowed to make it more than 30 feet because then they can't make a brach on it. Because halachically, when a person walks in the street, looking straight, they can see up to 30 feet. Over 30 feet, they have to pick up their head to look at it, and therefore that's not called publication of the, publicizing the miracle. Okay? So what happens if somebody lit the menorah 35 feet up and then they lowered the menorah they put it down to a lower place they did not do the mitzvah why because when you light the menorah it has to be in the proper place with the proper amount of oil or candles to burn that the right time it has to be there if somebody lit the menorah with a tiny amount of oil and then added more oil, they're not gay to the mitzvah. Because that initial oil that they lit at the time they lit did not have enough to burn the proper half an hour, so they're not gay to the mitzvah. If somebody lights too early, the earliest somebody could light, the earliest somebody could light, but even then it has to burn all the way until after half an hour of the nightfall. And it says in Allah, it's not a good thing to do. So for instance, in LA, it would be 341 would be the earliest one could light. 341 in the afternoon, but it would still have to burn to 20 to 6. And even then it's not halachically a good thing to do. So sometimes you have Bachim and Yeshiva, they go right away on Mifzoyim and they come home at night and they light late and you know, if somebody comes home late and everybody's sleeping, it's questionable if they can make a bracha or not. If they live by themselves, they can make a bracha by themselves. But if they live in a house and everybody is sleeping and they're coming home late, Allah says, really, you have to light without a bracha. It's better to wake somebody up at least and then light the candles that they should see it. This is one of the reasons, by the way, where you are not Yetzel with an electric menorah. Lighting a menorah with electricity or anything like that is not a Yetzel. Number one, it might not be a flame, which is issue number one. But the main reason is because when you light with electricity, present, you don't have that electricity. It's constantly flowing slowly through the wiring. So when you lit the menorah, you didn't have that enough fuel to burn a half an hour because electricity right there is for two minutes. Now it's coming more and more and more. So then you're not getting it. Technically, if you be able to create a battery operated flame, that means the battery giving the power for the for the menorah to be, because the battery is right there, you might be Yetzir. It's another question by itself, but it's possible then you would be Yetzir because you have it, you have it all there, all the energy, the fuel is there for half an hour. When you go to public lightings, you are not fulfilling your obligation by listening to a public lighting. Just like the custom is in Shul, after Mincha, somebody lights the menorah in Shul with the brachas, Yet, he himself, like the guy that lit the menorah, is also not Yetzir. He has to go home and light again. For, even if he lives alone, he still has to go home and light the menorah. 
The only thing is, if he lives alone and it's the first night, he doesn't have to say Shachyonu again if nobody else is home. But otherwise, if he has family members home, he even says a Shachyonu. You are not Yetzir with the menorah which is lit in Shul. Um, another thing is that the candles have to be on the same line. They have these modern menorahs, very nice, very beautiful, but you know, different heights and different things and you know, you're not yet, those are not kosher menorahs. Uh, for a lot of reasons, but let know going into the um, reasoning for that now. Now, Friday night, the second night of Hanukkah, it's getting late for Allah, I'm going to go to Siddhis. Um, Friday night, the second night of Hanukkah, you have to light before Shabbos candles, which means you light, custom is you have a mincha first if you have a minion early for mincha, if not, you have a mincha afterwards with a minion. But you light, first you light the Hanukkah candles before candle lighting, and then you the woman lights the Shabbos candles. Now, when you light the Hanukkah menorah, because you're lighting it earlier, so again, candle lighting is, let's say, 425 in LA, and it has to burn to minimal to 540. You have to make sure that you have at least an hour and 20 minutes plus of enough oil. The regular Hanukkah candles don't do it. So if somebody uses the regular Hanukkah candles, you're on the box, you can't use that for Shabbos. What you do for Shabbos is take Shabbos candles and use them as the Hanukkah candles. Just like you light Shabbos candles, you light separately Hanukkah candles and so on. For a Saturday night, so we have a Marv and Shul, and then we come home and we make Havdalah, and then we light the candles, and then we say V'yit that's the custom in, in, in the house. Also, starting tomorrow night, for the duration of Hanukkah, there's no more tachnun for the eight days of Hanukkah. But also, besides the fact that we just started saying the same talumotor, the vrach in the Shemun but during the Yom Tov of Hanukkah, number one, during the three Shemun or the Shredish four Shemun uh, we add al -anism. If somebody forgot al -anism, they do not repeat the Shemun But you have to say, you have to try to say al -anism. If you wash for bread, you have to say al -anism. If you didn't, I mean, if you got it, you do not have to repeat the bench. So these are basically the, the dinim in a nutshell. Let me just see if there's any. Now, what happens if you light the menorah and the flame went out? So because we said before, that the lighting does the mitzvah. So technically, if I light my menorah with proper oil, proper place, proper everything, and the menorah went out, the light went out, I don't have to relight it, I still did the mitzvah. The custom is to relight it, except Shabbos, you can't. So Shabbos, you can't uh, do this. You can't um, relight it because it's Shabbos. Um, our cost is okay. You can use either new wicks every night, or by the way, more and more detail during Shabbos. And this is very important, then, by the way. During Shabbos, the menorah is totally mukhtsa. That means where you put the menorah, the Hanukkah menorah, Friday night when you lit the candles, you cannot move it until Shabbos is over. So just keep in mind, you have to put it in a place that's safe for the entire Shabbos. Otherwise, you have to put it on the table or somewhere because it's completely mukta. And according to the Alter Rebbe, it doesn't help putting a sitter on the tray of the Hanukkah Menorah to be able to move it later. The Alter Rebbe doesn't hold that it's good. Other people say it's good. Other people say it's not good. Okay, we're going to stop here for the halachas. If you want more of the halachas, you can go online. Uh, Jewish Beverly Hills, you have the halacha newsletter that we give out for Hanukkah. You can find all the info there. Okay, let's talk a little bit this about Hanukkah. Okay, there's two rabbinic yomtas we said a year, Hanukkah and Purim. <clears throat> Hanukkah, there's no mitzvah to eat per se. Purim is a mitzvah to eat. It says you, it's preferable, but 
See, Purim, when you eat and Purim, it's a mitzvah meal. Chanukah, it's not a mitzvah meal unless if you speak Torah at the meal. If you speak Torah at the meal, then it becomes a, a, a so this mitzvah. It becomes a mitzvah meal. What is the difference between Chanukah and Purim? Why is Purim a mitzvah to eat? And Chanukah, the mitzvah is lighting candles. So this is a very fundamental thing. The decree of Haman and Purim was like today, what Hamas wants to do is to wipe out a Jew. It doesn't matter if he's a religious Jew. It doesn't matter if he's a non-religious Jew. They wanted to kill men, women, and children. So therefore, the decree of Purim was on the body of the Jew. Therefore, how do we celebrate that nullification of that decree? By eating. Hanukkah, as we'll soon discuss at great length, Hanukkah, there was no decree against the body of the Jew. There was what was called the Misyavnin. Misyavnin in English are called the Hellenists. The Hellenists in that time was, by the way, a lot of Jews went over to the Greek mythology, to Greek religion. They became Misyavnin. The Jews became Greeks. Those Jews that became Greeks were held in high esteem. They were made big politicians, big government officials. What was the decree of Hanukkah that we'll soon discuss at greater length? It was against the neshama of the Jews. You're, the fact that you're a Jew, as long as you don't do the Torah mitzvahs, you're fine. So therefore, it was went against the neshama of the Jew. Unlike Purim was against the body of the Jew, Hanukkah was against the neshama of the Jew. Therefore, what do we do? How do we celebrate Hanukkah? Lighting candles. A candle, Ner Hashem Nishma Sadr, the candle of God is the soul of man. So it's a decree against the soul of man, not against the body of man. So what happens is everybody knows the miracle. I don't have to elaborate the miracle. You know, there was the mighty army of the Greeks and the few Jews and the Jews won the Greeks and they came into the race of Migdosh. And the Greeks impurified Kol Hashmanim Shebeich all the oils in the base of Migdosh. All the oils, it says. And the Jews looked and looked and looked and couldn't find. Finally, they found one jug of oil, which still had the seal of the Kohen Gadol of the high priest. So they knew it was not defiled. And it was enough oil to last one day. And the miracle happened, it lasted eight days. Why eight days? It took them eight days to get no oil. Some opinions say four days there, four days back. Some people say they were impure fighting the battle, so they had to wait seven days to become pure again. But the bottom line is, this little jug of oil, which was sealed with the seal of the Kohen Gadol, was found and it miraculously left, lasted eight days. There's a very interesting halachic problem with that. There is a din in halacha, you're not allowed to do miraculous mitzvahs. <clears throat> You're not allowed to do mitzvahs miraculously. There's a famous story when Dalt Rebbe Yutas Kislev. He was, they, the prison was in an island and they would ferry them back and forth to, to interrogation, interrogation the rooms and chambers. And Dalt Rebbe was going on a ferry and he saw the Levana and he wanted to do Kiddush Levana. The guy, he said, al Rebbe said to the captain, do me a favor, stop the boat. You don't, don't forget, it's a prisoner with a death sentence. Uh, stop the boat, I want to do Kiddush Tavana. He said, what are you, crazy or a prisoner? And he didn't, he, he didn't stop the boat. al Rebbe miraculously stopped the boat. And al Rebbe said to him, you see that I can stop the boat. Okay, so I'm asking you, I'm going to start it again, and I want you to stop the boat. That I should do Kiddush Tavana. He saw he had no choice, he did it. So the Rebbe asked, if the Rebbe stopped the boat, why didn't he do it already then? And the answer is, you're not supposed to do miracles, mitzvahs with miracles. Hashem wants 
miracles within the guidelines of nature. We're taking the natural world and making it holy, not miraculous things. So the question is, how were the Jews allowed to light the Menorah with miraculous oil? It was miracle oil. How could they do a mitzvah with miracle oil? And the question goes even stronger. There's a rule in Halacha that Tumba Putra Betsibur, which means when the majority of the community is impure, the laws of impurity don't apply. We find that by Pesach. If the whole community or the majority of the community is Tame, impure, they could bring the card in Pesach anyway. If a few people were impure, they had to bring it to Pesach Sheni and the second Pesach. Tumba Hotra Betziba means when the majority of Jews are Tame, the laws of the impurity don't apply. So the question is the Jews would be allowed to use that impure oil because there's no laws of impurity there. So the question is like this. Halachically, they were allowed to use that impure oil. Yet, they chose to do something that halachically was incorrect. To use miracle oil. Why did they do it? Why did they want to do miracle oil if they could have halachically used the regular oil? So there's a lot of interconnected things here. Okay? Between the uniqueness of Hanukkah, what the Greeks wanted and what the Jews did. To preface it with another issue, the difference between Hanukkah and the lights of the Beis Amigdash. Why do we celebrate, why do we light the menorah on Hanukkah? Because they defile the oil of the menorah, so therefore there was the menorah, so we light the menorah. Like us. <clears throat> There's three differences between the menorah in the base of Migdash and the Hanukkah menorah. Number one, where was the where, where was the base of Migdash menorah lit? All the way inside, not outside, inside next to the Holy of Holies is where the base of Migdash menorah was lit. Secondly, when was it lit? During the day, not at night, during the day. Thirdly, it was always seven candles. Always seven candles. What do we do, Hanukkah? Just the opposite. Where do we light it? Facing the street. When do we light it? At night. And every day is not the same amount. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It would make sense, if you think about it, if you want to commemorate the Minerva, the Beis Migdosh. You know what it logically would be? Every night of Hanukkah, we should light seven candles. Like it was in the base of Mikdash. We don't do that. First of all, nowadays in Allah have a menorah of seven candles. But because it's a replica of the base of Mikdash. But why is these three differences of Hanukkah different than in the time of the base of Mikdash? I'm going to ask a bunch of questions and then I'm going to answer it with one point. The center point of Hanukkah. In the Allah Nisim, and it's interesting, there's two aspects of Hanukkah. One aspect of Hanukkah is, the Gemara says, for what was the miracle established, the holiday? Bahalel the Hoda'ah. To say Halal and Allah Nisim. No mention about the candles. Then the Gemara says, the Rabbis instituted the lighting of the candles. It's interesting. In our in Shmanesi, we say Alanisim. Okay? In Alanisim, we say in the days of Matisyo, when the Greeks stood up to make the Jews forget Tatum, and make them transgress, and Hashem did miracles and he gave the weak in the hand, the strong in the hand of the weak, and the many in the it doesn't talk about anything about the candles. At the end it says, with Liko Nadis, the Khatsis Kachacha, they lit candles. We're in the courtyard. That wasn't the menorah. In the base of Migdas. Nor in the base of Migdash was all the way in there. This is about festive candles. In Haneri Salolu, that we say when we light the candles, not a word about the war. There's two different things going on in Hanukkah. One is about the war, and one is about the lighting the Menorah. But both have one common point to it, and that is as follows. 
the Greeks wanted, not that the Jews should stop doing mitzvahs. They didn't want the Jews to stop learning Torah. What the Greeks wanted, that the Jews should learn Torah as a secular wisdom, and they should do mitzvahs which are logical, not because God said so. In other words, like we said before, what did the Greeks fight? You want to do logical mitzvahs? Why not? Beautiful morals, ethics. You want to study Torah? It's a brilliant book. Of course, study Torah. What we don't want, the Greeks said, we want it not godly. I.e., we want to impurify Torah and mitzvahs. Godly Torah and mitzvahs are holy because holiness is godliness. The Greeks said, we don't care if you do mitzvahs. Not God's mitzvahs, though. And therefore, if you notice in the Alanisim, it's interesting. It says some strange expressions here. It says, what did the Greeks want to do? It doesn't say they wanted the Jews to forget Torah. Torah means they want the Greeks wanted the Jews to forget that it's God's Torah, your Torah. Or to make them to transgress. That God wants. They said again, you want to study? You want to study Torah? As long as it's not God's Torah. You want to do mitzvahs? As long as they're not God's mitzvahs. As long as they're logical mitzvahs. And then there's another question over here. It says, what is the miracle? Listen to this. God gave the strong in the hand of the weak. That makes sense. Rabbim biyad ma'atim, many in the hands of the few, makes sense. Utmeim biyad tahirim, the impure in the hand of the pure, what type of miracle is that? Or the next, Urishoyim biyad tzaddikim, and the wicked in the hand of the, of the tzaddikim, or the sinners in the hand of the people that do Torah. What's the, I understand, you want to say the miracle of the war. They were very powerful, the Jews were weak, the Jews won. The Greeks had many people, the Jews had few, the Jews won. That makes sense. What's the <laughs> uniqueness over here of Tehedim that he gave over the impure in the hand of the pure and the wicked in the hand of the tzaddikim? That doesn't show power and might. What, what, what's he teaching us? So again, the point of Hanukkah is a very simple point. Be a logical human being. Don't be a godly person. And therefore, what did the Greeks want, really? The Greeks didn't want that the Jews should not like the menorah and the base of Middash. They didn't care. They wanted the Jews to like the base of Middash. Because, think about it. If the Greeks didn't, the Greeks were very learned people. The Greeks knew that halachically the Jews would be allowed to use that oil. The Greeks knew Torah. They knew that if everybody's impure, there's no laws of impurity. If their purpose was that the Jews should not like the Menorah, they didn't accomplish anything. What they should have did was destroyed it, not impurified it. But this is exactly what the Greeks wanted. The Greeks exactly wanted, wanted exactly that the Jews should like the Menorah. But how? With impure oil, not pure oil. There was a story when the previous Rebbe came to America and the previous Rebbe preached that America is not different and you cannot have uh, adulterated the Yiddishkeit, compromised Yiddishkeit. It has to be authentic Yiddishkeit. You cannot have any compromised Yiddishkeit. And the so-called leaders of the Jewish people of that of, in America came to the Rebbe and he said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, there's a fire burning, a fire of assimilation. You want to put it out, 
You want to put out the fire? You need clean water. Take any dirty water. What do they say to him? Why do you have to find pure Yiddish guy? Take any Yiddish guy. It, it, it's, it would at least put out the fire. It sounds logical. But the previous Rebbe said to them, the previous Rebbe said to them, you're making a big mistake. If you're talking about clean water and dirty water, you'd be right. But if you expect to extinguish a fire with kerosene, not only are you not going to extinguish the fire, you're going to make the fire bigger. What the previous Rebbe said to them is, you're making a big mistake. Compromise Judaism is worse than no Judaism. And that's exactly what the Greeks wanted to do. The Greeks wanted that the Jews should use impure oils. Now the Jews come into the Beis Hamikdash, and they see what's going on. The oil is impure. We're allowed to use it, but that's exactly what the Greeks wanted. So what should the Jews do? The Jews had Mesidus Nefesh. They knew this is not the best way of lighting the menorah with miraculous oil. But the Jews said to light the menorah with impure oil means that the Greeks won. That's exactly what they wanted. And the Jews said that we're not going to do. So the Jews lit the menorah with Mesidus Nefesh to the extent that Hashem showed them that you're right. They didn't know the menorah was going to burn for eight days. Even according to their opinion, they only put an eighth of the jug into the menorah each night. They didn't know it was going to last the night. They didn't know the menorah was going to last eight days. But they had Mesidus Nefesh to say, if this is what they want, there's no way in the world we're going to do it. This is what Hanukkah is all about. More than Purim, by the way. And the Rebbe explains an interesting thing. We mentioned before that Hanukkah was a, a decree against the soul and Purim was a decree against the body. That's why Purim is a mitzvah thief and Hanukkah, if you don't say Torah, it's not a mitzvah meal. By the way, it's an interesting B'nai Yisach, a great Pailusha Rebbe said, this explains the difference between Purim and Hanukkah, even with Jewish customs. Hanukkah, we play with a dreidel and Purim, we use a grager. So B'nai Yisachar says, the handle of the dreidel is on top of the dreidel. The handle of the grager is at the bottom of the grager. He says, why? Why is that Jewish custom? Hanukkah was a spiritual decree. So the handle is on top, representing spirituality. Put in, the decree was on the body. So they put the handles below. Where do you hold it? From below, earthly. But the Rebbe explains another very interesting thing. Taita has a lot of names to it. Taita is called bread, water, milk. We mentioned this briefly the other class. And then Taita is also called wine and oil. So it says, let's see this. Bread and water represents the revealed part of Taita. Wine and oil represents the secrets of Tata, because wine and oil are hidden within the grape and within the olive. So oil and grapes, wine represents the hidden Tata. Within that itself, there's difference between wine and oil. There is four parts of Tata: Pshat, Remez, Drush, Sod. The simple meaning the hinted, alluded to meaning, the homiletical meaning, the Kabbalistic meaning, corresponding with the four letters of God's name, corresponding with the four worlds, corresponding with the four cups and Pesach, corresponding with the four sons, million fours. For him, the Gemara says, he's supposed to get drunk on wine. Chayiv in Ishlub Sumba is supposed to get drunk, I mean, not literally, but Rashi says, be yayin with wine. Purim is wine. Hanukkah is oil. 
What's the difference between wine and oil? So the Rebbe explains it's a great long, lengthy sicha. And wine is even holier than oil. I mean, sorry, oil is holier than wine. It's greater than. Why do you see that? Oil floats over all liquids, even wine. Which means oil is above wine. Secondly, oil is. You can take, you can make oil from anything. You can only make wine from grapes. Oil is more mesita snappish because how do you get oil of anything? You squeeze it to the to the core, and when you squeeze it to the core, you get oil. That's the level of mesita snappish. The Rebbe explains, yes, Purim was mesita snappish. Boy is mesita snappish. They wanted to kill the bodies. We had Mesidus Nefesh. Not to forsake Hashem. Keep Torah and Mitzvahs a whole year. Chanukah is a greater level. Chanukah is a level of Mesidus Nefesh to the essence of the Neshama. And now we can understand what we asked before. What's the difference between the Menorah and the Beis Migdosh and the Menorah of Chanukah? So he said the menorah in the base of Migdash was all the way inside. Secondly, it was during the day. And thirdly, at the same amount of candle seven. Hanukkah is at night, outside, going up, up, up to the number eight. What does that mean in, in a deeper level? The base of Migdash seven represents time and place. Time and place could only illuminate inside the base of Migdash. It doesn't have the power or the ability to illuminate darkness. To illuminate darkness, you need a much stronger, powerful light. Hanukkah is super powerful that the Hanukkah menorah, the Mesidus Nefesh, for pure oil that the Jews did, awakened within the Jews the power of the Neshama, what's called Shemen, which represents the essence, as the Rebbe explained, the Yechidah Sheba Nefesh, the Pintali, the essence of the Jew. That level of menorah can illuminate the street. It could illuminate the darkness of the street. And in fact, the Gemara says, how long can the, should the candles burn? And the Gemara's expression is, Adekalia Rigla de Tarmudoi. There's a nation called Tarmud. They were the last ones walking in the street because they were wood, wood sellers and they you know, gave the wood to everybody at night. Tarmud is a level, then same letters as Moradis, rebellion. What is the Gemara teaching us according to Kabbalah and Chassidus? What is the purpose of Hanukkah Menor? Adekalia. Kalia means it finishes. Rigla, the feet, the lowest level of the rebellion, of the rebellious people, of evil. What is the Indian of Hanukkah? You take the Menor at night when it's dark. Outside in the Rishusarab, a public domain where they don't sense the oneness of Hashem, and over there you kindle the menorah. But in what in what way? On the first night, you do the mitzvah of one candle, you did it the best possible way. Mahadri mina mahadri, the best of the best. On the second night, though, if you light one candle, yes, you did the mitzvah. Because halachically, the mitzvah is one candle per household per night. Mahadrin is, everybody does it, one candle each night. Mahadrin in a mahadrin, everybody does it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That means, what is the lesson that I've explained? When you're talking about the essence of the Jew, there has to be constant growth. The first night, you did the mitzvah the best possible way. Comes the second night, 
One candle is not enough anymore. For yesterday, it was good. For today, you need two candles. Second night, you light two candles. You did it the best of the best. Comes the third night. Two is not enough anymore. You have to go to three and four and five and six and seven until you come to eight. What does eight represent? Eight represents the supernatural level of God. Supernatural eight we discussed many times. What's the power of Hanukkah? The power of Hanukkah is to take the darkness of the world, the Roshul Sadabim, the public domain, and over there, you light the candles in way of going more and more and more and more. And that's why part of the miracle, what we say in al Hashem gave the impure and the hands of the pure. It's not only talking about a physical war. Part of it is talking about the physical war. Many in the hands of the few, the strong in the hands of the weak. But then al committed, there was a different battle here. It wasn't a physical battle. The powerful forces of evil are strong. And Rishoyim and, um, the majority of the world are Rishoyim, wicked, as we see today. The whole world hates us. So part of the miracle that Hashem does that even though we're the minority, but we're pure, we don't use impure, compromised Yiddishkeit. We use pure Yiddishkeit. In that battle, God also gives the impure in the hand of the pure, the sinners in the hand of the tzaddikim. It's an equal war. It's a physical battle of might. You know, the Greeks versus the Jews. And then there's the Goyish kite of Greeks versus the spirituality of the Jew. So Hanukkah is really a spiritual holiday. And this eight, number eight, this it's late, but this number eight is another beautiful thing. We learned many times eight represents Mashiach. That's what the Kayaka writes. It, it's all about Mashiach, above time and place. In the dreidel in America or outside of Israel, what are the four letters on the dreidel? Nun, Gimel, Hei, Shin. Nes, Gadol, Hayosha. A great miracle happened there. If you ever see an Israeli dreidel, it doesn't have Nun, Gimel, Hei, Shin. It has Nun, Gimel, Hei, Pei. Nes, Gadol, Hayosha. Here in Israel was a big miracle. Outside of Israel, the dreidel says, Nes Gadol HaYosha. The letters Nun Gimel Hei Shin, which is the same letters as Goshna, where the Jews went down when they went to Egypt. The Rebbe brings us down, other portion bring it down. Nun Gimel Hei Shin, the numerical value is 358, which is the same numerical value as Mashiach. It's interesting. Israeli dreidels, it's not a shin, it's a pay. It doesn't equal Mashiach. The, the dreidels outside of Israel, meaning darkness at night when there's powerful forces of evil, that's where you can bring Mashiach. That's where Neskadol Hoyashab. That's where you have the letter of the Gaishna, which numerically equals Mashiach. Because only in Golos, and the Rebbe said the same thing by the last day of Pesach. The last day, basically, made to this Mashiach. In Israel, they don't have an eighth day. The seventh day is over. We have an extra day. That means in Israel, they don't have the concept of Mashiach that we have on the eighth day. The Rebbe explains because Dafki in Golis, when it's dark outside and this, and there's diversity and pluralism and lack of one God, that's where the Jew has the ability of Hanukkah. The Messiah's Nefesh of Hanukkah. In the spiritual battle, we need to have uncompromised Yiddishkeit. We need to have true blue Yiddishkeit. And then Hashem makes a miracle. We see that Hashem made the miracle. Okay, anyway, um, again, once again, again, the class is sponsored 
by Moshe uh, Baraman in honor of his mother, his grandfather, his uncle. Everybody should be well. And in Mir Tushem, next week there's no classes. Monday and Wednesday there's no classes. Tomorrow night, if you live in LA, we're having a grand Hanukkah in our Rodeo Drive, 8 o'clock from 8 to 9.30 via Rodeo. We're also having the Mishul Community Dinner Friday night. Those who want to come, please um, reserve. Until then, everybody have a friend from Hanukkah. Great Shabbos. And we should only hear good news. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom.